the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you might overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That verse from Romans 15 has been my prayer for you as you prepared for house church today, as you prepared to be together. And I'm just praying that God's going to fill you with hope and peace and joy. And it's just going to come pouring out through you as you serve other people. Here's what I want to ask you to do today in your house church as we begin. Would you take your Bibles out and would you read out loud together Psalm 100? Psalm 100. And then I'm going to ask you to discuss it together, to pray together, to give praise together. The timer is going to come on the screen and you can just hit pause until your house church is done. And then once you uh, are done praising God and praying and discussing Psalm 100, uh, come back and we'll continue the conversation we're going to have together today. I hope that one of the things that came up in your discussion of Psalm 100 today was the difference in some of your translations, especially the difference in, found in verse 2. Many of your English translations say, worship the Lord with gladness. Other translations read, serve the Lord with gladness. And I believe, after investigation of the scripture, that serve is the most accurate translation. The word can be correctly translated either worship or serve. So here's what I'd like you to do in your house church right now. I want you to talk about how serving is worship. How serving is worship. As a discussion starter, maybe you can think about the questions that Pastor, the questions that Pastor Woldridge left us with last time. As he talked to us and led us through Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, he ended with this is what opportunities to serve do you see before you? Maybe you want to look at that past tense. What were the opportunities that you had last week to serve and how did you do? The second question was this, how is God calling you to trust him, to use your gifts and walk in them in obedience to our Lord Jesus? How'd you do last week? Did God call you? Where'd he call you to trust him? How'd he call you to use your gifts and, and were you obedient? Discuss these questions in your house church. Again, a timer is going to come up on the screen. Uh, you can just hit pause. You discuss until you're done. And by the way, I want to ask you to add a third thing to discuss. This one might not take very long. Is, does anyone in your house church know the name Mrs. Lloyd Edwards. You discuss those things, and then we'll come back and carry on our conversation. I hope you have had great discussion in your house church and that one of the questions you really wrestled with was was how are worship and service tied together? How do you how do you worship God by serving? Because you absolutely do. And Pastor Woldridge last week just challenged us to serve God using our gifts and our talents, and there are going to be opportunities that come in front of us. One of the questions I get quite a bit as a pastor is this: um, how do you serve God? Or how do you serve the Lord? And I think one correct answer, maybe the most correct answer, I don't know, is you serve God by serving others. On one occasion, Jesus was telling a story of his second coming, and he said when he returned, he was going to point a couple of things out to us. And one of the things he was going to point out to us is that uh, he said, Matthew chapter 25, he says, recorded, Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. You saw someone hungry and you gave them something to eat. You saw someone thirsty and you gave them something to drink. You saw a foreigner among you and you took them in. And the people were shocked. Well, well, we did that for them. No, but you were doing it for me. And the others who didn't do those things, who didn't feed someone when they were hungry, who didn't give someone water to drink when they were thirsty, who didn't see a foreigner and let them in, who didn't see someone naked and give them clothing, when you didn't do it to them, it's as if you weren't doing it to God. Here's what Jesus was getting at. When you do something for someone else that makes someone else's life better. Do something for them that they can't do themselves for themselves. When you serve them, you're serving God. What I've noticed over the years is that some people serve out of guilt. Some people serve out of duty. Some people even serve out of peer pressure. 
But God wants you to serve out of gratitude for what he's done for you. He made you, he saved you, he's promised you heaven as your eternal home. Gratitude, I believe, is the best motivator to serve others. And so with Acts 6, uh, 1 through 7, the pastor Wilder talked to us about the last week, the church, early church was growing and there were need for people to step up and serve. The pastors, the leaders couldn't do all of it anymore. And so they just needed some people to step up and serve. And it's interesting to me as the things God's been teaching us that where they needed them to serve was around the table. How are you doing serving around the table in your home? But I just want to talk to you about five things about that the Bible says about serving God, about serving others. And as you serve others, you're serving God. First thing I want you to understand this morning very simply is this. Serving is part of your life purpose. Serving is part of your life purpose. As we've been going through Acts, and Pastor Woldridge reminded us last week, uh, we must obey God. Four words that we looked at. We must obey God. There are three other words that we've looked at. We are witnesses. We're supposed to be the witnesses. And one of the ways we witness is to serve other people. Mark chapter 8, verse 35 says this, Only those who throw away their lives for my sake. This is Jesus talking. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Family, until you learn how to serve, you're not really living. You're just existing. It's been said that you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give away. When it comes to serving, what is God calling you to to give away? Who is he calling you to serve? What opportunities has he put in front of you? Serving others. We are witnesses. This is part of our life purpose. The second thing I want you to know about serving very simply is this. Serving makes you more like Jesus. The scriptures say in Matthew chapter 20, that even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Maybe we could put it this way. If you don't learn how to serve others, you will never grow to spiritual maturity. In fact, if you don't learn how to serve others out of gratitude, I think you'll stay a spiritual baby your entire life. Third, here's what I want you to know about serving today. Serving, I believe, is one of the greatest use of your time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. It's the greatest use of your time. If you want to make an impact and leave a legacy, the greatest use of your time is to serve God by serving others. Please remember that your service to the Lord is never wasted. It's the greatest use of your time. Fourth this morning, I'd like for you to understand that service and serving is the secret to greatness. Again, in Matthew chapter 20, the scriptures tell us, if you want to be great, you must be the servant of all the others. True greatness comes from servanthood, not from living for yourself. The greatest leaders are those who serve the most. In fact, we might put it this way. If serving is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. If serving is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. Jesus is looking for those who serve. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. Fifth, I'd like you to remember this about serving. Serving will be rewarded in heaven. Mark chapter 10 records these words of Jesus. Jesus said, I guarantee this truth. Anyone who gave up anything because of me and the good news will certainly receive a hundred times as much. Wow. Ultimately, our real boss is Jesus. And one day he's going to reward us for everything that we've done for him. That, my family, is a guarantee. Five quick things about serving. About this time in 2019, I began to pray and began to ask God, God, as we move into this new decade, the 2020s, what, what does our church need to focus on? What would you have us focus on? And God gave us as a leadership team a, a verse for the decade, and it comes from Psalm 37.3. Six words, trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. How are you doing in those two things? Trusting him and in doing good. A few verses I want to zero in on with you as we think about serving this morning. Titus chapter two, verse 14. And I want you to keep this one handy because this is the verse I want you to use as we go to the Lord's table in just a few minutes. Titus two fourteen says this. He, speaking of Jesus, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Wow, that's why he died, to make for his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Ephesians chapter two says this, that you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has planned in advance that you should spend your life doing. 
One translation says that you should spend your life in helping others. Do you start to get the theme of the scriptures we saw as Pastor Wolders led us through Acts chapter 6 that everybody needs to step up and serve, not because they have to, but because they get to, because that's one of the reasons God chooses us. That's one of the reasons he calls us. That's the thing he's planned for us to do, to spend our lives serving others and to do good deeds. But sometimes it gets hard, and the scripture writers know that. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord, because sometimes it's just hard and it gets discouraging. Listen to these words one more time from Titus 2.14. He, Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. I think what we see from these passages of Scripture and from how Pastor Woldridge opened up God's Word to us from Acts chapter 6 last week is this. Uh, every Christian, every follower of Jesus is a minister. Not every follower of Jesus is a pastor, but every follower of Jesus is supposed to be a minister. That means you get to use your talents and your gifts to make a contribution in life, to serve the Lord by serving someone else, to be a giver and not a taker. Throughout the scriptures, over 58 times, I think maybe it's exactly 58 times, the Bible uses the phrase one another. It says these kind of things, love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, help one another, counsel one another, support one another, and on and on and on the list goes. It's a reminder that the mutual ministry of every believer in the family of God is to and for the benefit of every other believer in the family of God and for those who are on the outside of the family of God. That's the way God meant for it to be. The truth is serving God by serving others, however, is not easy sometimes. Sometimes you're going to get discouraged. So what do you do when you get discouraged and you start to just stop serving? I want you to remember two things. If you don't remember anything else, would you remember these two things when you start to get discouraged? Because it's going to come. You're going to get discouraged. You're, maybe you're going to get discouraged because, like we saw in Acts 6, your widows aren't getting as much food as the other widows. And things aren't going exactly what you want. And things seem, seem unfair. And you just feel discouraged when it comes to serving. The first thing I want you to remember is this. You are going to receive a award that will go on for eternity. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 6. God will not forget how hard you've worked for him and how you've shown your love to him by caring for other believers. You're going to be rewarded in heaven. And second, would you please remember this? God uses every little thing you do in serving others. Nothing is too small. Nothing is insignificant when you serve God. Nothing you do in service for the Lord is in vain. The scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 15, keep busy always in your work for the Lord since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. I asked you earlier to discuss if any of you knew the name Mrs. Lloyd Edwards, and my guess is you probably didn't. I've been thinking about my mom a lot recently. Her birthday would have been just a few days ago. Mom's been with Jesus for six years, but I still think about her and especially on her birthday. But my mom's life in the early years, in the later years it turned out good, but in the early years, you'd probably say my, my mom's life was hard. She grew up poor. She grew up living in places and towns that most people would say weren't the kind of places and towns as part of town you wanted to live in. My mom also grew up her life early on on the move. In the 12 years of public school education, my mom went to 13 different schools. And it wasn't like she just moved from our town to the town that neighbors. No, my mom would make moves from Spartanburg, South Carolina to Brooklyn, New York, from Brooklyn, New York to Covington, Kentucky, from Covington, K Kentucky to Los Angeles, California. These were across the country kind of moves. There are a couple of reasons that she moved like this. Partly it was because her father had a job that he worked for paper bag companies and he set up factories so he would go, but he would often go before the next paper bag factory was meant to be set up because my grandfather was a gambler and he wasn't good at it. And he didn't just gamble the kind of money, oh, I've got a hundred extra dollars this month, I'll do that and I'll stop. No, he's the kind of gambler that gambled away the family's food money, that gambled away the family's rent money. And sometimes they had to move before his next job was ready because he was on the run from those to whom he owed money. My grandmother would go out and work 
mainly in the evenings because she needed to care for the family to try to have money to buy food and pay the rent. When my mom and their family moved to Covington, my mom was born in Covington, Kentucky, but then she moved. When they came back to Covington, she lived on Wood Street, again, part of town that you didn't want to live in, and they, they lived up above the corner liquor store in an apartment above the liquor store. My mom was poor. She was dirty. She very rarely was able to clean up. She didn't have very many clothes. The clothes that she had, with the exception of one dress, was all of her clothes were dirty. She never had a winter coat. She didn't really have shoes that would get her through the winter. My mom had one older brother and he was seven years older than she was. And by the time my uncle was 12 or 13, when his parents were out of the house in the evening, he was often entertaining his girlfriends. Promiscuous might have been the word they used back then. He was often entertaining his girlfriends in the house and locking the doors and keeping my mom out of the apartment. While living in Covington, Kentucky, something began to happen in my mom's spirit. We now know that it's the Holy Spirit in uh, drawing her because we never make a move towards God on our own initiative. God moves towards us and challenges us to make the move as we've been seeing. But as a six-year-old, a five-year-old, almost six-year-old, my mom would say that she felt the need inside of her to go to church, so she would get dressed up in her one clean dress that was very tattered, the only dress that she wore owned. She'd put on her dress and she would walk, and she walked to several churches in Covington, Kentucky, and most of them turned her away because she was dirty, because she didn't smell good, because she was hungry, and they just thought, this little girl's gonna take too much of her time. But on one Sunday morning, she left Wood Street and walked a little over a mile to Madison Avenue, and she walked inside the doors of a church on Madison Avenue, and they welcomed her. And week after week, they would feed her. And one kind lady in the church would help her every Sunday, and she'd take her into the restroom and give my mom privacy so that my mom could clean up. She even taught her how to clean up. She would even, this kind lady would even buy my mom a new dress, and she'd keep the dress at the church so that my mom could walk into the church and put on a new dress that she could be proud of. She would buy her new shoes. She would buy, buy her, over the course of the years, a, a winter coat. But my mom, when she would tell this story, would say that the best thing that she ever received from that church on Madison Avenue on Wood Street was this, this very Bible. Next month will mark 77 years ago that my mom was given this Bible, September 26th, 1946. September 26th, 1946, that's the inscription. And it was given to her, the name on the inside of this Bible that it was given to her wasn't the pastor's name. In fact, my mom would say she wouldn't remember the pastor's name. The name on the inside of this Bible that gave my mom this gift 77 years ago was Mrs. Lloyd Edwards. And I'm guessing in your house church, nobody knew her name. I'm guessing in my house church, besides me and my wife, nobody knew her name. Mrs. Edwards simply saw a little girl and she knew that she needed to serve her, that she was serving God by serving this dirty, stinky, poor little girl who didn't have anything, who couldn't repay. I share this story with you to say, God has called you to serve. And there's a chance when you serve, nobody else will ever know what you did. And you're not doing it for the applause of mankind. You're doing it for the Lord. You serve the Lord by serving others. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. A simple Bible. One of the things also, you, nobody may ever know your name, but one of the things I believe is that Mrs. Lloyd Edwards had no idea the impact she would make by making an impact in the life of one little girl. 77 years later, the Bible that she gave away is still in the possession of that little girl's son. 70, 77 years later, because this lady, Mrs. Lloyd Edwards, nobody knows her name. She made an investment in one little girl and that little girl's sons both became pastors. You're one of your pastors, me. The 27 years that I've been the pastor here at Miami Valley Church, one of the things that we've loved to do is to give away Bibles to children and to teenagers. 
One of the reasons we're asking you to help us give away Bibles to, to children and teenagers from birth to 18 again right now. One of the reasons, not the only reason, is because of Mrs. Lloyd Edwards, who gave away a Bible, who planted a passion in my mother to give away Bibles, who's planted a passion in me to give away Bibles. And in the course of 27 years at Miami Valley, I don't know, literally we've given away thousands and thousands of Bibles to people, never knowing what the impact will be, but knowing that being faithful to see a need and give somebody the most precious gift they can ever receive, the written word of God, and so they can receive the, the living word of God, Jesus himself. Here's what I know for sure. God's going to call you to serve. God's going to give you opportunities. He's going to put opportunities in front of you. And Pastor Fultridge showed you that last week. And he said, "How did you? what are you going to do with the opportunities God put inside of you? Will you be obedient? And I would simply say this. Remember last week, I thought the sermon was so incredible. And one of the things Pastor Fultridge said is, who was on the other side of your yes? Mrs. Lloyd Edwards said yes to serving my mom. And she has no idea the countless number of people that have been reached who are on the other side of her years. Some you might know, some you might never know, but God has called us to be people who serve. And so here's one of the things I wanna ask you to do. I wanna ask you to gather in your house church right now. And if you're not part of a house church, may I beg of you, may I employ you, may I do whatever I have to do to beg you to get involved in a house church that's where your life is gonna be changed. It's gonna be the place where you can know and be known, love and be loved, serve and be served, where you can truly meet needs. And God's gonna do amazing things in your life through the people that you surround yourself with. And so get involved in your house church. If you're a house church, I want you to take the elements of the Lord's Supper. And I want you to focus on this verse, Titus 2.14. And if somebody in your house church has the New Living Translation, New Living, you can look up it up on one of your phones, Titus 2.14, this is the verse I want you to read and talk about and discuss as you go to the Lord's table. It says this, he gave his life, Jesus. The bread and the cup remind us that he gave, us his, gave his life. A sinless life, the bread, his life lived. The, blood, the cup representing the blood, his sacrifice for our sin. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, thank him that you've been cleansed, to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. When you go to the Lord's table, thank him for the life that he lived, that freed you from every kind of sins, that cleansed you, that uh, made you his people, and it gives you purpose to live a life of purpose, to live a life of service. It doesn't take very much. And nothing you ever do in serving the Lord will ever be done in vain. And he will remember and he will reward a hundredfold who waits on the other side of your yes. Will your eyes be open to opportunities? This week, will you be totally committed to doing good deeds? Father, as we take the bread, as we drink the cup, we're reminded that Jesus gave his life to cleanse us from sin, to free us, to make us his own. And he's looking for a group of people totally committed to serving him by serving others. So Father, may this meal not just be ritual. May it be a challenge. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. Show us this week how we can serve and how we can give. And may we say yes, even in the little things. And God, if like Mrs. Edwards, we never know on planet Earth the impact of our serving, we trust that you'll take our simple yes of obedience and use it and multiply it in ways that bring honor and glory to your name. For your name is way more important than any other name, the name of Jesus is above every name, and we worship him at his table together. And we'll get up totally committed to doing good deeds. In his name I pray, amen.